What's going on guys? I want to welcome you back to another Q&A video. As always, everything is timestamped. If you have any questions, leave them down below. So with that said, let's get started. First question. When I unrack on the bench press, it feels like I'm wasting a lot of energy taking it out. Like it actually drains me. Got any tips? Yeah, there's two things going on. Number one, the point at which you unrack is either way too low or way too high. If it's too high, what's happening is you're losing scapular retraction. So you're making your shoulders go forward like this and you end up doing like this weird pressing motion. And if it's too low, well, what happens is you're actually doing like a full range of motion press for the most part. So the solution out of this is to simply bench press in the power rack. That's why you'll notice in my training videos, I tend to bench in the power rack the majority of the times because it is fully adjustable. What you want is the fact that when your arms are fully lengthened, you can literally drag the bar out. And that's another thing. Don't press the bar out. You want to drag the bar out. Dragging the bar out will ensure that you do not lose scapula uh, tightness. And of course, you're not going to drain any energy doing this. The moment you press that weight out, you lost your tightness and you drain your energy. So try out these two tips and it should help you out. Hey, Alex, how can I improve my conditioning while increasing my body fat percentage? Is it possible to still be explosive and athletic while going bear mode? Absolutely, man. In fact, if you look at a lot of NFL players, most of them, you can call them bear mode. A lot of them are not even lean. A lot of athletes are not lean. There's this big misconception that to be athletic, you got to be stupid lean. I mean, look, that might apply to certain sports, but not all. Are you aware that there are heavyweight boxers? You know, a lot of these guys are fatter than you and me, but they're fucking fit as hell. More fit than both of us. They can kick our ass. So it doesn't matter what body fat percentage you are. All you have to do is do some conditioning work. So if you're in a calorie surplus and you are doing GPP two to four times a week, you're doing some low intensity cardio, there's no reason why you should not be fit. There's no reason why you should not be athletic. I mean, because you are heavier, that might put a bit more stress on the joints. You might lose a little bit of motor coordination in a sense. But overall, you should still be a very a fully functioning athlete, depending on what sport you're trying to do. So that's that next question. Hey, Alex, what might cause pain on the back of my neck when doing deadlifts? Thanks. Two things. One, you're hyperextending your neck. So you're creating a lot of pressure on the disc. Or two, you're looking all the way down. So now you're stretching your neck downwards while you're lifting this heavy weight. So the solution is to just keep a neutral head when deadlifting. Simple as that. Don't look too up. Don't look too down. Also, I'm going to recommend that you start doing direct neck work. You see, back in the day, I used to have neck pain when doing squats, deadlifts, stuff like that. Actually, I used to have really bad neck pain. And the way that I corrected it was by doing neck extensions, neck curls, all that type of stuff. So I believe that if you start training your neck directly, you're not going to get headaches anymore when you do your exercises, and you're not going to get neck pain when doing deadlifts. So give it a shot, and let's move on to the next question. Can I build a big neck with calisthenics? Yes, you can. It is called wrestler bridges. I suggest you Google them. Lots of wrestlers have built great necks by using this method. No weights. All you got to do is use your body weight, and there's tons of variations that exist. So type in wrestler bridge variations on YouTube. There'll be tons of uh, resources for you. And of course, I'll be releasing more stuff on the bridge as well. So stay tuned for that. Next question. What are your thoughts on auto-regulation, Funk's PR table, over set volume and intensity days for training? Yeah, man, I used to do that for a very long time. That was actually my old system called the Alpha Body, which is now off the market for information. And it did work exceptionally well. I got very strong following that system. The only thing, though, is that you really got to know your body and auto-regulate correctly. If you fail to auto-regulate the proper way, you're going to have uh, recovery issues and you're going to have strength plateaus. So that's probably the number one limitation of this type of system. It's that the fact that it's auto-regulated. It's not set in a specific format. Like when I say volume intensity day, you know that you're going in, you're going to do some singles, some triples on your intensity, right? And when it's volume day, it's fucking volume work. So all you got to do is stay true to those principles and rotate the variations. And every time you go back to it, you make PRs. So it's less juggling in your mind. There's less things to take care about. And it's more guaranteed strength. But in terms of like which builds strength faster or whatever, I don't really know. Uh, I can confirm though that the auto regulation stuff does work. But it's a little bit more tricky. You got to pay attention to your body. And I would say that's the number one flaw uh, with that table. But other than that, it's a solid system. And give it a shot if you really want to go that route. Next question. Yo, Alex, how do you know what an accessory exercise are needed on full body routines? How do you arrange that when you don't hit those small muscles that hard? Uh, two things. Number one, you need to look at yourself physically. What muscles are weak physically, right? Like, so if you do have small triceps, if so, then do more accessory work for the triceps in your full body session. It's an easy thing like that. Are your biceps already really developed, but you need more forms? Okay. In that case, remove, remove a bicep exercise, put them, uh, put in a form instead. It's little stuff like that. You got to look at how weak the muscle is physically and how weak it is in a movement, you know? So 
Are your triceps limiting you and your bench? Do you have lockout problems? If so, start doing some more extensions, start doing some more pin presses, make your accessory work specific to the aesthetics of your muscle, as well as the strength weaknesses of the muscle. And then secondly, make sure that the accessory lifts are specific to the sport movement. So if you're trying to raise your bench press, you want to do stuff like dumbbell extensions, barbell extensions, uh, lots of push downs. You know, you want to do stuff that's going to help you raise your bench press. Doing a bicep curl, for example, is not going to increase your bench. It might help with the tendon strength in the forearm and elbow area, but it's not going to actually raise it directly. So what I'm thinking, like for me, the way I think it is, I break it down. I think main movement, supplemental movement, and then the accessory movement that builds everything that I talked about before. So if you, if you approach it like that, Every time you do a movement, it's supposed to raise something that's in the larger picture of things. Then I think you're going to make the best gains possible. So that's that next question. Alex, should my lower back be sore after heavy below the knee rack pulls? It's not the spine that hurts, but just either side is tender and sore to touch for one to two days. Can't tell if it's doms or if I'm doing something wrong. Okay, here's what you guys need to understand, right? If your spine is not hurting, the, the actual lower back itself then you probably just have DOMS in the muscles that are around the spine, the spinal erectors. That's all it is. Sometimes it could be an injury. Sometimes it's just regular DOMS. Okay. So it's not like I always said this guys are going to tell me that their lower back burns. Right. And I'm going to respond with this. Well, does your spine burn? And then when they think about it, they're like, Oh fuck, you're right. Like their, their spine, you're not injuring your spine when you do a below the knee rack pull. Same thing when you do hyperextensions, you're just strengthening the muscles around it. Right which gives you DOMS, but it's not an injury. It's not the fact that you snap your shit up. It's just DOMS in your lower back. So I say this, is the pain in the center of your lower back or is it directly on the sides? You indicated the sides, therefore I believe it is DOMS and nothing really serious. So that's all you really gotta think about, man. And of course, below the knee rack pulls, like I'm always telling you guys, is going to be more lower back and hamstring. That is what you're gonna get. Lower back is gonna be the number one thing that limits you in a below the knee rack pull. Whereas when you do above the knee, Lower back is practically not involved at all. You could have spinal problems, right? And still do rack pulls above the knee. And that's another reason why I prefer them over below the knee. So that's that next question. What do you think of high rep work with rack pulls? I noticed they never do them on volume days. Why? Okay. High rep rack pulls, they definitely work, but guess what? They're also very draining and, be and because high reps tend to lead to form breakdown, there's a higher risk of injuring yourself, you know? So that's the only thing with high reps. I did them a lot. That's actually how I got really strong at doing rack pulls. On my volume days, I would do like three sets of 10 or three sets of 20. That shit worked amazingly well. It gets you mad sore in the upper back of traps, gives you really good work capacity gains. It's a phenomenal thing to do, but it is very draining on the body. And like I said, form breakdown could occur, you know? So that's why if you're going to do rack pulls for very high reps, I say do it at the knee or above the knee. And uh, whatever techniques you could use to make yourself upright, totally do it. And also I would refrain from behind the back simply because you're going to feel too much quads involved, but that's just based off my personal experience. But yeah, you can definitely do high rep rack pulls. Uh, nowadays I tend to do more dynamic effort type shit, like 12 sets of two, nine sets of three, stuff like that. But if you want to do a three by 10 or three by 20, whatever, be my guest, it's going to work just fine. Next question. Can someone replace weighted planks for Zerker holds as an ab exercise on your program? You talking about my novice program or naturally enhanced? You didn't really specify, but if it's uh, my novice program, absolutely not, man. You got to run the system as intended. I wrote it like that for a very specific reason is to promote recovery, strength development, just run the program like it indicates. Okay. And read the Q and a section. I answer all the questions, right? If I didn't add any other questions, it means it's not supposed to be there. So no, no Zerker rack pulls or Zerker holds on my novice program. It's going to fuck up your recovery. You're going to have issues. Weighted planks is the way to go. Now for naturally enhanced, yes, you could do Zerker holds over weighted planks. Absolutely. I mean, I give you tons of flexibility. There's over 300 exercises in the program. You customize it the way you like. I'm not going to force anything upon you. So that's that next question. What do you say to people who give you gym advice, but clearly have no idea what the fuck they're talking about? Honestly, man, you really can't do anything because people are set in their ways and they're not going to change. So I say, just ignore these guys. Don't pay attention to them and uh, just uh, let them do the thing. I mean, worry about yourself, worry about your own gains. Stop thinking about what the other guy's doing. I mean, look, he's going to make suboptimal gains. You're going to make good shit. So just forget about what he's doing. Focus on yourself. It, this really isn't a problem. And if he tries to lecture you, just say, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, or try to get him off, you know, say you're busy, whatever, but don't like, don't, don't try to school him because that's not going to work. You could, if you want, but I, I just say, quit wasting your time. Focus on you. Don't worry about what all these other guys are doing. Just Fuck them. It's all about you. So that's that. Next question. How can I increase my vertical jump? Should bigger guys, higher body fat, avoid training for vertical jump? 
uh, for, for, for big guys, no, you should not. But it also depends on the sport that you're doing. Uh, for example, right, let's say you're doing football. You're going to be a bigger guy, but you still got to do vertical jump training. You're not going to stop doing explosive stuff just because you're in higher body fat. So, no, you can still do that type of stuff if you're higher body fat. But in terms of what I would do, uh, number one, I would do some type of box squat. High box in particular because that is more specific for vertical jumping. So a box squat with bands should help you out a lot. I would do some box jumps or death jumps. And if you want some good recommendations on that, uh, read the book, Special Strength Training, A Manual for All Coaches by Dr. Vrikoshansky. He gives you all the variations you need, such as like split squat jumps and stuff like that. I mean, there's a lot of detailed shit. He really breaks it down on how to raise your vertical. So check that book out. And then the final thing would be to include some type of uh, dynamic effort training. And this is discussed in Science and Practice of Strength Training. So read that book as well. But essentially, it comes down to doing stuff like uh, 12 sets of two on box squats at 50%, 55, 60. I mean, look up the stuff. I'm not going to break down how, how dynamic effort works, but it's a, it's a rather simple concept. Just look it up, man. And uh, those are the three references I'm giving you. So that's that. Next question. Alex, as a skinny beginner, do you think I should start off a calisthenics-only program before doing a weight training program? You can do that if you want. That's actually what I did. I actually did calisthenics for years before moving on to weights. And when I did move into weights, my work capacity was fucking phenomenal. I had really good weight, uh, work capacity. I was able to weight to pull-ups without a problem. I was already like, I had an above average base because of calisthenics. And I sincerely believe that had I not done that, I would not be where I am today. So I know some guys say, Alex, you seem to be anti-calisthenics, but no, I'm not. I used to do it for a long time. I was very good at it. And it does give you good gains. So if you don't have a gym and you want to like get some starting work capacity in there, get like a starting foundation of size, you know, be my guest, then move on to the novice program. You're going to have a better base than most guys who start off as total beginners. So I think it's a good idea, man. If that's what you want to do, be my guest. I mean, certainly if I can go back in time, being, being very real with you guys, I would do it all over again. I would definitely do calisthenics, but I would not repeat it for like three, four years. I would have done it for a shorter amount of time and then move on to weights because I think it was a really great experience. And even today, as a heavier weight, I could still do most of the calisthenics moves. And I, I think that's really badass. So yeah, man, give it a shot if you want. I'm not going to force anything upon you. At the end of the day, you do what you want. So that's that next question. What's your opinion on full body four times a week? Every other day, would it have an adverse effect on growth and recovery? Uh, I used to train like that, and I made great gains. It's actually, it's pretty good. It works very well. You make fast strength gains. The only thing, though, just like I said with the other question about full body, is the fact that you got to auto-regulate your shit really good. Really, really good. And it's not like you're going in and you're doing one volume day, one intensity day. You're kind of splitting it a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're going to have two volume days, most likely, but they're not going to be as high. They're going to be like medium volume, if you will. And the intensity days is not going to be as intense, if you will. The percentage is going to be a little bit lower. It's going to be a little bit different because you can't, you can't have like very, very high volume and very, very high intensity four times a week. See what I'm saying? So you're going to have to adjust something. You're going to have to go into auto-regulation. Auto-regulation is pretty much the only way to train if you're doing full body four times a week. That or something that's very, very structured with percentages. Uh, but yeah, man, if you want to try that every 48 hours, be my guest. I trained like that for a long time. It worked just fine. And uh, yeah, give it a shot. Hey, Alex, when you start force-fitting yourself or increasing the portion of food for calories, do you get used to it and it gradually gets easier? Yes, absolutely, man. Eventually, it becomes second nature and you don't, it doesn't even have to be force-feeding. Force-feeding is more like a temporary thing to get you into the habit of eating more food, but eventually it's like you know that at this time you have to eat your food. You know, you know that when it's time to eat this food, you got to fucking finish the whole thing. Like I know when I started having 500 grams of pasta, it was hard to eat all of it in one sitting. I'm talking 500 grams dry, right? I would have that in one sitting, right? So I would force feed the fuck out of it. Nowadays, I can go in, I make 500 grams, put the sauce in there, you know, I eat it like it's one meal. And then three hours later or two hours later, I eat another meal. So yeah, it gets easier as you do it. You just got to get a little bit of experience with it. Okay. So that's that next question. Hey, Alex, I'm thinking of jumping on Bulgarian light. Now that I've started weightlifting, I've heard this can trash your nervous system though. So what should I do to prevent that? If you want to run the system without having recovery problems, I say work up to 90% of your one rep max. Don't work up to 100%. Keep it at 90 and leave it at that, right? I'm also going to suggest that you get some really good food in your system and really good sleep. If you're going to do Bulgarian, it has to be done right. You need to have a calorie surplus. If you ask me, calorie surplus, lots of sleep. And then the, the percentages, no more than 90% every single day. And you should make uh, really good gains for that. That's how I would run it personally. Like if I was doing Bulgarian, I would do it like that. Because it is, like you said, hard on your nervous system, hard on your recovery. So hope that helps you out. Next question. Hey, Alex, how do I prevent my hands from tearing on rack pulls? That shit gets annoying quickly. Edit, even with good straps. 
Honestly, it's possible that you're just not grabbing the bar correctly. Uh, see, I have small hands, right? So I don't really tear my hands. Uh, I used to tear my hands a lot when I would do climbing because you, you fucking you jump from one object to the, to the other. Like it's a lot of friction, right? So I used to get all kinds of tears. But nowadays, I'm pretty much, I'm never tearing anything. See these, these calluses on my hands? I've had them for years. They don't, they don't fall off. And I don't trim them either for your information. I just leave them the way nature intended. These are my fucking, my gloves, my warrior hands, the rough. But yeah, I don't, I don't tear my calluses. I think uh, that shit happens once a year, if that. Like it's very, very rare. And it's usually just one of them. Usually the middle finger or some shit. But the thing is to get around that, you need to grab the bar correctly. Meaning put it lower in your hand. Because what you're doing right now is you're placing the bar up here, right? And then as you start pulling, the bar creates friction. It drags up your hand and now you tear off your callus. So you just got to learn, you probably have big hands, right? So learn how to get it in the bottom portion right here. See this bottom portion here where the calluses are? That's where you want that shit to end up. See, I have, I have small hands. So when I grab a bar, like it gets the whole fucking thing. So I never had to worry about this problem. But for you, you're going to have to adjust the way you grab it, okay? So that's that next question. When running concurrent training, you swap out a lot of exercises. Should I switch rack pulls with deadlift variations or should I just change rack heights? Thanks, Alex. Okay, it depends on your goal, what you're trying to do. Are you doing rack pulls to get better at rack pulls or are you doing rack pulls to get better at deadlifts and vice versa? That's what you need to identify for yourself. Personally, if my goal was to get yoked, real talk, I would do zero deadlifts. I would do zero, zero deadlifts. It would never come across my program because it's not specific enough for building my yoke. It's more so posterior chain. What I would do is play around with rack heights. I would do below the knee, rack pull, at the knee, above the knee, behind the back, snatch grip, Jefferson, uh, different band tensions, you know, that's how I would do it. I would even pull off blocks. So that's if you want to get yoked. But if you're trying to do rack pulls to improve your deadlift, then yes, you could rotate uh, deadlift variations with rack pulls, but make sure that it's specific enough, such as below the knee rack pulls, six inch block pulls, four inch and two inch. That's going to give you the best carryover possible. So what are you trying to build? You need to identify that for yourself. And uh, yeah. Hey, Alex, are rack pulls enough for big traps or heavy shrugs are also a necessity? Well, look, I've always said that if you want the best traps possible, you need to do the rock pulls, the cheat shrugs, the cheat rows, and the direct neck work. This is the complete formula for getting yoked. Like, this is really going to maximize your gains completely, okay? So I think that's what you should do. But theoretically, let's say for some odd reason, you're, you, you can't do these lifts, right? You can only do one exercise, you press on time, whatever. Yes, you can get big traps with the rack pull exclusively. That's how good they are. If you get strong with the rack pull, you're probably going to get big traps. Are you going to get the best traps? In my opinion, no. I think you need to do... You need to do the other things that I'm talking about. But yes, if you can include one lift to get big traps, it would definitely be the rock pull, hands down. Can I build muscle with only weighted stretching? That is a very good question, my man. And it's something that I've been thinking about for a very long time. Because as you all know, I used to have the smallest traps in YouTube fitness. They were absolutely puny. And then I started doing the yoke train that I'm always talking to you guys about, and they fucking blew up. And pretty much the way I got them big was through weighted stretching. I identified the fact that farmer walks build your traps through weighted stretch. And I thought to myself, okay, what is going to give me an even better stretch than the farmer walk? And that's when I understood that it was rack pulls above the knee. Because you can overload the upper back of the traps like no other. You can lift thousands of pounds and more. So, rack pulls is how I got my big traps for the most part, as well as the power shrugs, also maximize the stretch, direct neck work, cheat rows, all these things emphasize weighted stretching. So, I have no reason to believe why you would not be able to get jacked in other body parts. I mean, look at the weighted chin up. What do you think makes your, wide, your, your lats wide from weighted chin ups? It's the fact that you are hanging off the bar. Your lats are being stretched. So I think the same thing could work for you. In fact, there have been studies posted recently about calf training. If all you do is go on a calf press machine, right? The calf raise and you just fucking stretch, your calves will increase in size. It's been proven. We know it works in size. So guess what? Weighted stretching will most likely work for other muscle groups. In fact, about three months ago, I released a video on weighted stretching and I had a subscriber take on the challenge. All he did was stretch out his arms with overhead extensions and incline curls, right? And guess what? They got bigger. He gained half an inch on his arms from exclusively weighted stretching. So you know what? I'm pretty much convinced that this is the secret to getting jacked. And I will, by the way, be incorporating this method on other body parts. I plan on doing like hanging off a puller bar for long periods of time with like super fucking heavy weights. I plan on stretching out my arms, like every body part you could think of. I'm going to stretch the shit out of it, in including the neck. I'll be doing uh, the neck curl in reverse. Basically, you take a head harness on, you put it behind your body and you just let it stretch like this. So yeah, man, weight stretching is fantastic. You could get bigger with doing it exclusively. Next question. What would be your number one trap exercise that has the least implication for the lower back in terms of spinal rectal fatigue? That would have to be the seated dumbbell shrug. 
because you can still lift. Like, it's tough to do. It's much, much, much harder than a standing dumbbell shrug. It's very strict. You can get a good contraction of the traps if you really care about that. But yeah, that's what I would do. If you have a spine problem, just sit down on the bench, grab some two heavy ass dumbbells. Adjustable would be preferable because you can lift more weight and start shrugging, you know? I'm not a, like machines can work too because they're low stress on the lower back, but I would say fuck machines, do free weights. And, uh, but one thing though, I want to let you know though that power shrugs are low stress in the spine in general. So you're not going to have lower back issues if you ask me. Like if you do a power shrug, you're upright. What injuries are going to arise? You're, you're literally standing fucking upright and you're just shrugging, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, you don't need to do the seated dumbbell shrug, but if you really have a fucked up back, that's my go to movement. So that's that. Last question of the week. What job do you exactly do? I reckon YouTube isn't your full-time gig yet, or is it? Okay, man, if you go to my site, outalpha.com slash contact, you'll see very clearly what I do. Basically, I give strength and conditioning advice online, and I provide services such as email exchanges, Skype consultations, uh, custom programs, online coaching. That is one facet of my income. I also sell two programs, right? One is the Alpha Diet, which is a, a book. It's an ebook that teaches you about regular nutrition, and of course, I have Naturally Enhanced, which is my bestseller, which is my fucking, that's what made me popular in YouTube fitness, which is the fact that I taught guys how to get big without drugs by emphasizing the six essential areas, being the neck, traps, upper back, shoulders, forms, and glutes, and it follows concurrent periodization, full body, I mean, lots of cool stuff like that, and that's pretty much how I make my money. I have two books, I have my consulting services that I offer on the outoffer.com slash contact, and I do YouTube as well. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. If you have more questions, Leave them down below, and I will answer them all next week.